Hello, 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 Podcast Movement 2019. Welcome back to the Vox Nest live stage. This session today is about the content and industry. Are they friends, relatives, total strangers? There are more than 2,700 people at this podcast conference today. This is huge. A few years ago, podcasting was a hobby that people did in the garage. Now it's a full blown career with the positions and just huge companies. So today we're gonna have the conversation from people in that industry. So without further ado, please give me a hand as we introduce to the stage our panelists, Nigel Poor from Air Hustle, Francesco Bashir from Vox Nest, Martina Castro from Adante Media, and Matt McDonald from Radio Public. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, how are you? Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And in this panel, we would like to explore the relationship between content and industry that, thank you. For my experience, they, I, I've always saw them like two separated things, two different uh, sides of, of, of a wall. And I would like to, to see if there's a chance to try to talk between these two sides and find uh, some uh, points in common. Uh, I, I prepared uh, um, um, some rounds of questions. So you have to keep up with the... Um, uh, some rounds of questions, but feel uh, free to uh, come up and make your own question because it's like a very white hot, hot topic and uh, it's good that we open up this debate. Um, so uh, this is our amazing guests on stage, uh, Nigel from Hirasto, uh, Francesco Vascheri from Voxnest, Martina Castro and Matt McDonald. Um, so um, the, the the first place I would like to start uh, from is Nigel. We, uh, me and you, we met in 2016 because we were in a, in a competition right by Radio Topia called Podcast. And at that time, I remember that during the competition, we found out that uh, the show that would have won would have to produce 24 episodes uh, per year, and I said, oh, and I remember that I was overproducing my own uh, pilots. I, like, I could never make it. Uh, so I never asked to you what happened uh, after you started working on the show and how the original idea you had had to deal with the fact that you had to produce uh, 24 episodes and different seasons and how you combine idea and schedule. Yeah. So I, I had never done podcasting before. So when I heard 24, it didn't seem like a big number to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this is going to be not so difficult. But then as we got into it, I realized it was excruciating. And the podcast I produce is out of a prison. And so that makes it even harder. And there was no way we could do 24 episodes. We can't do 24 episodes. So we do, um, our goal is to do 16 to 20 a year. Um, so there was something good about being naive going into it, so it didn't freak us out. It gave us kind of a cushion. Um, but I would say that the thing that I learned doing a podcast is that you basically don't sleep or have a life to, to stay on track. Um, but I also felt like the quality of our program was really important, and we couldn't just hit that number to hit that number. And luckily, we work with Radiotopia and PRX, and they're super supportive of it. I don't quite know how people hit that number. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but that's the truth of it for us. Yeah, and during the production, what are the kind of decisions that are more uh, content and uh, creativity oriented the one that we have to do it because I'm sorry, I can't. Um, the, the kind of decisions that you have to deal with that are more content oriented uh, and the others that are more we have to do because we have to okay. be on time no, and we have to we're very fortunate that all our decisions are content driven and again i think it's because of where we make the podcast out of a prison 
when you mix prison and commerce, it's really problematic anyway. And so we just can't make decisions based on what the market wants. And, and I'll say again, we're really fortunate that we work with a network that understands that. I think if we were forced to meet the expectations of the market, our podcast would be terrible. I'm sorry to say, because I don't think we, would, we wouldn't be able to do the kinds of stories that are important to us. Yeah. What kind of concerns did advertisers have at the beginning? Like, I remember I was at PRX and at Radiotopia yeah. at the time. Like, what kind of decision making went into the advertise? Like, I, yeah. you know, knowing what advertisers are looking for. Yes. You know, the show and the material of the program itself. Yeah. Seems like it would have been challenging to try to secure advertising for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we're at first we weren't going to do any advertising. We are we went through um, fundraising and grants that we got, but then we did start doing advertising, and we, we, Julie Shapiro, who's our executive producer, and I scrutinized every potential advertiser that came our way, and we turned down a lot. So for example, we've had like bond bail, bonds bails, bond bailsmen, or home alarm systems, or jewelry shops, like things like that we just automatically say no to. So we turn a lot away, and again, we're in an unusual position. I'm sure most people can't afford to turn away advertising, um, so we're just really careful. And then, you know how a lot of advertisers want hosts to read the, to read the ads? And because my partner at the time, Erlon Woods, was incarcerated, it felt very weird for me to read the ads. So we didn't, we didn't do that. We had outside people read them. But then when Erlon got out, we flirted a little bit with reading ads, and we did. But it just sounded too weird to go from a story about life on death row to hear me and Erlon say, hey, do you want to come over and sit on my new cocktail bench? Like, you just... My Casper mattress. Yeah, our Casper mattress. Not yeah. Very comfortable. So now we don't voice any. They're very generic, um, and we do de we do get advertisers that are interested, but I'm sure they have concerns too. And again, we don't base our stories on what advertisers want to do. So we probably have less ads than other than other podcasts that are at our, in, you know, in quote success level, maybe. Um, and I wanted to ask Matt, uh, um, Radio Public was born around the same time, so 2015-16, if I'm not wrong, and the time when the monetization technology was changing the landscape and everything was changing at that time. And um, it's a company that has a strong connection with creators and they know, uh, you know what they, they go through in the production process. And I wanted to ask you how you deal uh, with this position between ice and fire, and try to uh, deal with both sides of the of, this, of the the industry and making things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reason I asked the question about the sponsorship is, you know, one of the things that has I've seen happen repeatedly is the types of content or programs and podcasts that are created that aren't able to secure sponsorship um, through whatever means. Like, I there are definitely programs that I know that have you know, six-figure downloads that were not able to secure sponsorship as a result of the content being not aligned well with brands. Um, you know, and I, I think that's something that I think a lot, like how does that shape the nature of the programs that are being created? And you know, I think what we've seen happen as a result of that is um, you know, different entrants coming into the marketplace who are saying like, well, instead of advertising, we can do this other support model, um, which allows the creative endeavor to take place, but then the relationship with the listener is sort of divorced from the show in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Um, and I think the thing that we are seeing more of is, and thinking about a lot, are ways in which direct monetary support from the audience itself can help support the programs. So, you know, I, I think, at its core, you know, pod, the thing that I love about podcasting is that it is it is so malleable, and that the creators have direct control. And it's great that your show can, you know, have that kind of freedom. I think most programs can't. Um, and I think being able to be in the position that we are, we see um, a need for diverse revenue streams, not just to be advertising focused. And that direct listener support is a major component in doing that. So. Um, I think that's, you know, an opportunity 
that has not yet been fully tapped. We see it a lot in other spaces, like Twitch and YouTube and more direct monetization in that area. And I'm pretty excited about that coming into the podcasting space. Um, Martina, uh, you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you started like as, as a straight producer, so you started doing radio. Mm -hmm. And going on with your career, you had to deal more and more with more industry decision and managing decision. What did you find out uh, during your journey? Well, that's such a good question. Um, so I did start in public radio and then, um, then moved into making podcasts, but I made Radio Ambulante, which is a podcast in Spanish. It's a narrative journalism podcast. Made it in our, just like everyone else probably, in our, you know, free time, in my pajamas, I was mixing it. And um, then now I run a podcast production company that works with businesses to make podcasts. So I literally, I mean, I went from public media to full on for-profit private business. Um, and so I have seen a lot of different sides of it and experienced different sides of that relationship between content and industry. Um, what I think uh, has changed for me um, is just my appetite to see what's possible with different types of partners that's in different perspectives on the same process. So right now I work with businesses. I work with Duolingo. We make the Duolingo Spanish podcast. Um, for me, my ultimate mission is to create new audiences and to bring new people into podcasting. And so when I was in Latin America and I saw that there were like literally nobody was competing with Radio Ambulante, I was like, well, you need to make some more podcasts that of this quality. Um, and so to partner with companies that have the resources, also built in user base, with people who, I know that people are listening to the Duolingo Spanish podcast who never have listened to a podcast before because we're getting them through the Duolingo app and to the Duolingo brand. I find the same like exciting um, opportunity with TED. You know, we make the TED in Espanol podcast. Um, different, a little bit different, but it's industry making. And so it's on this other side where if we didn't have companies with resources who were interested in making sort of tricky, risky, experimental bets on this new audience, I don't know how else it would happen. But that being said, I think you have to go from the resource side and sort of industry side and always support the creative and, ind and independent producer side. And so Adonde Media, before launching Adonde, I, I launched Podcasteros, which is a community for po Spanish language podcasters. Because one of the strengths of the co creative community, I think, in podcasting in the US was the NPR and public media sort of base and network and sort of spirit of collaboration, which doesn't exist in Latin America. So we've been promoting this idea of let's get together, let's make stuff together, let's share resources and training and education because you can't have a robust industry without talented people who are ready to take those jobs and get the experience that we need to have like high quality podcasts like we do in English. So. I don't know if that answers your question, <laughs> other than I, I'm not industry phobic. I think that it's healthy, but we can't forget all of the healthy legs of an industry, like a really important, supported, creative base of creators and independent producers. But also, I, I, I think it's wonderful that there are companies with resources who want to invest in making a new industry flourish. Like, without them, we, we can't do it, so. Okay, thank. Thanks. Uh, if you feel that a question is raised inside of you, uh, prepare yourself because I'll pass you the mic. Uh, if there's like the oh, there's audience the box, the okay, great. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, to Francesco, uh, I ask you to be here on the panel because I saw you uh, presenting something in, in London a few months ago about how uh, the next um, uh, 100 million listeners uh, who is using more Androids than Apple devices, uh, who are uh, discovering podcasting through Spotify or other apps that uh, weren't around in podcasting or so big in podcasting until a couple of years ago, are going to change like the market landscape. Can you, uh, thinking about the, da the data that you know, um, try to imagine how that thing can uh, change also the content landscape? Um. 
I think that surprisingly, that's not so hard to imagine. Uh, I think as a background, uh, podcasting consumption today or historically has been very skewed towards the Apple ecosystem because that's where the biggest uh, consumption or, or director of podcast was. Uh, that's the first device that had a, a podcast playing up. That's not working. A front and center on, uh, on the device. Uh, however, if you look at the uh, global landscape, or even the United States, uh, well, on a global level, the vast majority of users are using Android. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's bound to happen. I mean, somebody's going to unlock potential for these users to access this media. Now, what's going to happen? And I think that the short answer is regression to the mean. Uh, today, uh, it is true that there's all sort of content uh, on um, Apple Podcasts, for example, or on Spotify. However, the trend of consumptions are really skewed. Uh, the biggest consumers are those guys that are on the Apple ecosystem, and that this creates uh, a bias that's inherent in the type of um, consumption. Uh, content is always going to be uh, so varied, niche, and rich. Consumption is going to become more varied, niche, and rich. So uh, I think, bottom line, uh, it will become closer to all the other content areas the more we democratize listenership. That's, that's what's going to happen. Do you have questions already? Here, there's a question. Is there the... OK. No, you can come here, and so we can have loud. Oh, there's, yeah. Hey, that's pretty cool. I've never seen yeah, one of those before. Cool. Um, I'm a full-time podcaster, and I have a show, and I'll share specifics offline if anybody's interested in talking, that seems to resonate in the Latino community. Um, it's a moderately, what I would call, successful podcast, about 50,000 downloads an episode. So it's not Joe Rogan, but it's sustainable and helps me make a living. And the subject matter seems to really resonate with the Latino community, but my problem is I was stupid while I was in school and I took German. So I've been thinking, and I've, I've mentioned to Elsie Escobar uh, from Libsyn, the idea of creating a Spanish version of my show, but I couldn't host it. But I know how to do the show, I know how to produce it, I know how to market it, how to position it, are there any mechanism in place to partner with someone to create something like that and also license it so you can be a proper, a profitable venture for the creator, the original creator, and the people bringing the added value? Can I ask you to wrap up the question? Uh, I'm sorry? Can I ask you to wrap up the question? I just did. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was Who do I give this to? Uh, can I take that? Yeah, you, um, all of you. So, so what... I mean, I, I talk a lot about this, about how, what would it mean to take your show to a new audience in a new language. And I think I love that you're willing to partner with an outside person. Um, in Podcasteros, for example, we launched a directory of producers with all of their relevant skills, their location, contact information, um, country. Um, so, like, I would recommend, for example, look at where um, the majority of the Latino community that's listening to you is coming from. Uh, let's say they're from Mexico, go to the Mexican directory in our directory, which is, you know, the most handmade thing. You know, we have just been responding to what's lacking in our sphere, um, but it works, you know, and it's something that I, you know, we're going to continue growing, but also putting it out in the world that you're looking for a collaborator from Mexico, for example. Um, you will find people who are very eager to work with you and to like scale your model. And I think what it takes is just a real genuine interest in collaborating. Um, and a little bit of like letting it have its own life as well, because it might not translate as well as you might think. Uh, it's not a Google Translate type of situation usually. Um, you want to, you know what I mean? And I think that you get that, and that's why you would want to hire someone. And so it's opening yourself up to giving it new life. And I think that's awesome, and there are many, many, many people who would want to do that with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know nothing about that aspect of it, but what I do know is the 
the, the funding side of that is an interesting component as well to think about. Like, you know, spinning off that show, you know, how do you actually pay for the production? Like, how do you create that? Um, it's a plug, but the, we created an investment arm of Radio Public called Pod Fund, which is an investment vehicle in podcasts that I would consider, you know, I would ask you to take a look at because, like, it's providing growth capital to podcasters, like, in investments of, like, twenty-five dollars to $50,000 for shows that have demonstrated some growth. So, like, you could take that kind of money, find, you know, the partners that you need to be able to pull that off, and then that could be, like, growth capital to help you get to that new audience. Um, I would like to move on to a second round of questions. We have to be a little bit quick in the answers because we have 10 minutes. Uh, but one thing that I, uh, I, I'm living in a, in a, in a rec music recording studio right now, that's a weird thing, but uh, um, I, I can see every day how the m music industry works in a recording studio. And, it, and I wonder all the time, why we don't do that in podcasting? So podcasting is like a teenager industry right now. It's like 15 and it's trying to figure out what it is. And the connection with the radio, with the radio industry is quite clear. But can, can we imagine how podcasting, what podcasting can learn from other existing industries like publishing, uh, movies, uh, uh, um, on-demand TV, Uh, so I would like to start with you, Matt. What do you think that we can learn from other... Yeah, the one that I'm most interested in seeing develop and that we're seeing some momentum in is the, the streaming Twitch gamer community start to move into podcasting. Like, I think it's an audience that has a really deep understanding of how to talk directly to audiences in a way that um, you see in podcasting. But, you know, a lot of... There are many shows to me that feel broadcast-centric, like speaking at an audience as opposed to being very kind of with the audience that's happening. So the, the kind of cohort of creators and producers that we're starting to she so see show up on the Radio Public platform are really coming from that Twitch streamer space, which I wasn't expecting. And I think the production that they're bringing is just very different than the traditional radio-centric broadcast speaking to the masses space as are their expectations around like the kind of things that they're in tools and revenue and the ways in which they're trying to um, you know make money and grow their audience are just very very different than um, the radio community I think. Uh, Martina what do you think about it? especially about the roles that are playing in the like the music uh, a, a producer in music is different than a producing in Yeah I mean I have to say that one of the things that is always surprising to me is how late we are to adopting um, models to, to, to give life to our content in other languages. And so that's sort of where I'm at. Like, you know, the film industry, it, the book publishing industry, like the, you don't have to convince them that it's important to translate their content to not just one, but 30 different languages, you know, in some cases. And it's not perfect. And that's sort of like where I think we get stuck because we're audio only and because the intimacy is so important and the authenticity of what we're doing really hinges on the, that human voice coming from a true place. But I, I think we're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in that regard because we're just not doing anything. And so I can't tell you how thrilled I am to hear Hernan Lopez talking about bringing podcasting to the world and translating so many of the shows and that that's something that many companies are now thinking about seriously. Um, because yeah, you know, films that have, you know, slapped on dubbing from a, with a Spain Spanish accent and the, you know, sometimes the subtitles aren't great. People still love Hollywood movies in Latin America. And they have an intimate relationship with the woman who does like the Meryl Streep dubbing voice. You know, like that's their, that's Meryl's voice in Spanish and they love her. And so just thinking that for some reason we're not going to hit it just right, you know, is not a reason to not do it and to not experiment and bring our stories to other people in their native languages. How much of an impact do you think that advertising plays in making that happen? Because I, you know, the thing that I end up hearing is like, well, the Spanish language market from an advertiser's perspective isn't yet one that they're Correct. super interested in. I know. So <laughs> I, I would imagine that I, has an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and this is why for me, it was like, let's go to the companies that already have the money and the will um, to put, 
you know, to start betting on this because absolutely until, and it's sort of an, a chicken and egg problem. Like we just released um, a collaborative audience survey of Spanish language listeners in Podcasteros, only company, I mean, we're not even a company, we're a collective, only one to do it. There is no data about the listeners. Until there's no data, brands aren't going to want to bet on an audience that they don't know and they don't understand. So it's, we've got to kind of, there's this three leg, the content, the data, and the audience, it's in the, you know, it all has to come together. Um, but I think slowly but surely, we're kind of all inching forward. Um, brands are global. If they're If there's a bank that's like sponsoring a podcast in the United States in English, probably a chance that they would do a spin-off in Spanish, you know? And just thinking about expanding off of something that exists, they don't exist in a bubble. People are listening, one of the results that I found most encouraging, and people are listening, 53% of respondents to our survey are listening to podcasts in English. Like when they can't get it in their own language, they're coming to our stories to get it in their second language. Um, and so it's more fluid than you'd think. The, the boundaries are not actually very, I mean, it's the internet. It's, there aren't any. Um, I think we are imagining that they're stronger than, than they are. Yeah. And Francesco, uh, especially technology-wise, are you interested in what other uh, industries are doing uh, to promote their content or to m monetize their content as well? Well, technology-wise, there is so much one can do to help promoting or help monetizing. And I also think that the business models, uh, I mean, there are basically two or three business models out there. There's paid content, there's advertising support, and some kind of mixture of the two. Uh, not much else. Uh, yeah, of course, there's donation and other stuff, but uh, yeah, that, that's it. So what, what can we bring as innovation? I really think the battle is content here. Uh, and to get what you just said, Martina, I mean, I, I take it from a slightly different perspective, not Latin America, but Europe, uh, and I get a lot of uh, questions about, uh, oh, what we, could we develop, what, what might work in our country, and I always look at Netflix, and I, I subscribe to Netflix both in the US and in Italy, and we have the same shows that are translated, so uh, it, there's so much content that's universal, and you, you just have to bring it locally, and people will listen, And it's just that people are afraid to start. And I, well, so I, I have the technology hat here, so I should really talk about technology. I really go back, go back to the root of the problem. The root of the problem, uh, at least in this, let's say, quote unquote, underdeveloped markets like Italy, for example, is that uh, the consumers are not being exposed to all the amazing audio content that's out there. Uh, they, they don't know that it exists. And when, when this happens, they will start to want to consume more and more and, and everything will unlock. How do you do this? Well, you need to kill all the barriers to entry, uh, make it very easy for them to access content. And well, one way or another, Spotify is playing this, uh, this role in, in many countries. We have this uh, report where we show uh, in, in any country of the world, if the number one listening application is either Apple Podcasts or Spotify, And, uh, uh, of course, Spotify is taking over on the countries that are uh, heavily Android skewed. And these are the countries where we also see some kind of new stuff emerging, some, some, stuff, some novelty and uh, people starting to discover podcasts more and more. So I, I think the next 12 months will be very exciting for, let's say, a global perspective. And Nigel, I'm going to close with you asking, you mentioned that you were new to podcasting when you started here, Asso. Uh, what did you bring in your uh, new podcasting experience from your previous experience in photography and art? Right, yeah, so my background is as an artist and I deal before the podcast with galleries and museums. And so what's been interesting to me is to try to see how podcasts can fit into that kind of landscape. And currently, I'm working on an exhibition, and Ear Hustle is part of that. So it's been heard inside the Milwaukee Art Museum, and now it's going to be at the Berkeley Art Museum. So I, I'm, I like the idea that that, I, I don't know if you can call it a market, but it's a different way of thinking about podcasts, that they can fit into a fine art context um, and, and be, I don't know, I guess just brought into a different world. So I bring that aesthetic to it of... of, of stuff that's more idiosyncratic and small and um, 
what I've noticed is that there are plenty of people who are interested in stuff that on the surface may not have mass appeal. If it's well crafted, people will listen to it. It's been my experience. Thanks to all of you. Uh, it was very nice to have you, this sir. conversation and I hope that you carry it on uh, along your podcast movement in these days. And thank you again and see you at 2.15 for the goldfish tank that Can I'm I looking forward to. Can I make one little for. announcement? Yeah. Oh, if anybody wants to see the results of the latest Inquesta pod, it's, you can find it at, at inquestapod.com. They came out today, so feel free to thank you. get them. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody.